Okay, um, so we're going over the primate assignment now, so anybody who's missed the class and needs this information can have it. There are directions, um, but I'm going to give you some advice about it and how to go about doing the assignment uh, right now as we talk about the assignment. And also, as we're going over the material in the next week or so on primates, I will be lecturing and I will stop and say, this is something that's on your primate assignment. So you can make a mental note if I explain like a concept or something that you need to know for the assignment, okay? So keep your eyes and ears open for the next week and a half because a lot of what we do will actually relate to the assignment, right? The assignment in general takes, I would guess, about four-ish hours to do well, okay? You all should do well on this. The exams are difficult. People lose points on the exams because they test how much you've mastered all this stuff you've learned, which is a lot of stuff. I would like to see everybody get a perfect score on this. It never works out that way, though. But if you put the time into it, you will, okay? If you're one of those people who is dedicated and a hard worker, you will excel at this. If you're a person with a sm short attention span who doesn't like to work very hard, you may not do quite as well, okay? When you turn it in, I will say, how long did everybody spend on this assignment? And some people will say they spent an hour or two. Some people will say, most people will say between three and four. And then there'll be a couple of people in the room, the really anal retentive types, who will end up spending about 12 hours on it, OK? And that's fine if that's your thing. I'm just warning you. If you're anal retentive and you do a really thorough job of everything, you're clinical OCD, you may end up taking more than 10 hours on it. But it really shouldn't take you that long. It really depends on you. Um, so what you're going to do is research on a couple of different primate species. They are at, at the bottom of the page on a sticker. OK? Um, Let's read through the directions, and then we'll talk a little bit more about some of the specifics of the assignment. For this assignment, you will do research on two primate species whose names are printed on a sticker below. One is a prosimian, and the other is an anthropoid. Okay, those are the two divisions of the primate order. The one that is on top on your sticker is your anthropoid. Okay. The next two pages of the assignment ask for the basic information on your anthropoid species and your prosimian species. That's page two and page three. Okay. You are to answer the series of questions on the assignment using your text, the internet, and library reference books to find the information. I advise you to use all three of these. Among the very best sources to use to find information about your species is the Pictorial Guide to Living Primates by Noel Rowe. Okay. There are copies of this book at the Shepherd Library and the Social Sciences Learning Center where there are two copies of this book. In both the library and the Learning Center, you can't take the book out. But the book has a one-page profile of every single species that I've assigned in this class. And what you can do is either use the book in the library or the lab, or you can actually just photocopy the page for each of your species and take it with you. I just read it off. It's called The Pictorial Guide to Living Primates by Noel Rowe. It's cool. No, no problem. Uh, the internet in your textbook can help you with any concepts or terms that are unfamiliar to you or need cl uh, clarification. Many will be explained in lecture, so make sure to come to class or listen to the classes you miss on integrity. If you have a hard time locating the information for the assignment, particularly for the prosimian species, that's the second one that's listed, um, which can be quite difficult. It, can, it is often a good strategy to gather information on closely related species. Be careful, however. Not all closely related species are similar, and you are graded on the accuracy of your answers. This means that you should be discriminating in your use of sources, especially the internet. Make sure the sites you use are reliable. Um, let me remind you, if you haven't looked at the module for this week, because you, you, know, you don't necessarily always look at the modules if you don't have study questions or coin reading, but I put links to two reliable primate websites that you would, should consider using to, for, to answer the questions on the assignment. So you can find those on the Canvas module for primates. Look there. Um, this assignment is worth 150 points or 15% of your grade. It must be filled out in pen or computer printed. It can't be done in pencil. 
And your exam is on November 7th, which is a Wednesday. So, wait, November 7th is a Wednesday? Veterans Day is Monday? Yes. And it, that would be Monday the 12th, right? Yes. Because it's the week after the 5th. So we will need to make this do, um, well, your test is on the 7th. It seems counterproductive to have it do the same day as the test. Uh, let's make it do the 14th, change it to the 14th. Okay. I should warn you that um, I am going on a, uh, to a conference and I leave on the 13th and I'm going to be gone for a week. So I am going to line up a sub for you for at least one day and you will turn this into the sub or if it turns out that the day of the 14th is canceled, you can turn it into my box. But I will make an announcement about this as we get closer to that date. I, they only. By state law, I can only have people sub for this class that actually have a master's degree in anthropology, which means that I just can't have anybody walk in here and turn a film on for you to watch. It's whatever, state law, right? So I'm looking around for a qualified and, and hopefully entertaining person um, to, to uh, teach you while I'm gone. And they do exist, but I have to make sure that they can do the course. Um, so if that changes and the 14th doesn't work, we'll figure something else out. But right now we'll say that it's due on the 14th, okay, which is a Wednesday, Wednesday the 14th, the Wednesday after Veterans Day. Okay? Good luck. Woohoo! good luck. All right, so the next couple of pages, let's talk about some things. The first thing that I read, first of all, let me say one thing. There is a blank version of this assignment sheet. You're not writing a paper. You're filling this out, okay? That's point number one. There is a blank version of this on the Canvas website. So if you take a whole bunch of notes on this and it turns out to be a big, huge mess, what you can do is print out a blank one, turn it in in legible form so I can read it, and then just staple this to it, okay? But please staple this original to the one that you print up from the web because this original has your sticker on it, and I want that turned back in. Okay, so if you have to print up a second copy because this one's messy and has a bunch of notes on it, staple this one to it. Okay? Um, so that's point number two. Um, now, some advice, and you can write, if you can remember the advice I give you, that's great. If you're not going to remember, write it down in your notes or write it on this sheet. That's my, my first piece of advice. My next piece of advice is that the first thing you should do when you do this assignment is to locate the scientific name of the two species. I've only given you popular names or common names, and those are not particularly good for doing research. For example, if you have a chimpanzee, did anyone, does anyone have chimpanzee for their anthropoid? <coughs> Nobody got chimpanzee? Oh, too bad for you. Uh, if you put chimpanzee in Google as a search engine, you're going to end up getting a zillion hits that are uh, not entirely or mostly not useful. If you put pan troglodytes into Google search engine, you're going to narrow your search down to things that are more likely to be scientifically credible. Okay, So find the scientific name. I ask you to provide that to me as the first thing on both of the next two pages. So that's the first thing you should go out and find. Okay, Now, the primate order... Primates are an order of mammals. There are about 50 different orders of mammals. This handout I'm giving you here, which we'll make reference to, is a uh, one version of the primate family tree, as it were. Okay, and let's take a look at this right now before I make this point, because it'll be helpful for reference. But hang on to this and keep it handy, because we'll make we'll make reference to this as we go through the primate material. Bless you. Is that allergies, or do you have uh, something worse? What's that? You're fine. No, I'm sure you're fine. I'm not saying. <laughs> I mean, I hope you're fine, but it seems like a lot of people are sneezing. I was wondering if it's sort of allergy season. It's allergy season, right? It's kind of. It seems bad. Got a lot of sneezing students, or maybe it's midterms. I don't know. <laughs> it's it's allergic. I'm allergic to midterms. I'm allergic to grading midterms. You guys are probably allergic to taking them. I'm allergic to grading them. 
got about 500 in my office right now that are gathering dust. Those are extras. Thank you very much. All right, and we need five here. The one good thing is, is that you don't have another quiz or another test in this class for, well, actually it's only a couple weeks, right? But um, at least you've got that time to breathe. <laughs> and then there's only one more after that, which is the final. All right, and two for you guys. Okay, so the sheet I've just given you is uh, the taxonomic um, organization of the primate order. And it gives you the level, the taxonomic level over in the left-hand margin, right? So order is primates, right? And then it goes through suborder, infraorder, superfamily, family, subfamily, genus, and species. Okay, when you look at, super, at suborder, what are the two suborders of the primate order? Yeah, prosimii is how it's pronounced. You get to learn some Latin pronunciations in here now. Uh, prosimii and anthropoidea. Note that I tell you that your species that I've given you are a prosimian and an anthropoid. That means if you look at the pages two and three, after the scientific name, it asks for the suborder, right? So you know now that the suborder of your anthropoid species has to be anthropoidea. Right? Yes? So we got one of each suborder? Yeah. So then on the next page where it says your prosimian species under suborder, you put prosimii. There's two answers for you. Don't say I never did anything for you. In for order and family, you're on your own for you. You can find those. They may or may not be on this sheet. You may have to look on the web. One thing about taxonomy that I'll, I will tell you is that if you basically one question you'll have is do we have to know this? for the test, and the answer is yes. You do need to know this taxonomic information as to how the order is organized. We're going to be going over it and studying it, and you're going to be doing this assignment. So my hope is, is that when you walk in here to take the test on November 7th, you will know this stuff. I'll also give you a study guide, and we're going to have a study session. Okay, So we'll make sure you're prepared on this. You know now that the suborders of, the pr of primates are prosimii and anthropoidea. There are taxonomic <coughs> debates within primatology. Okay, Sometimes they'll say your species has subspecies. Other sources might say it doesn't. Right? There's also an alternative classification of primates that divides primates into two distinct suborders, not called prosimii and anthropoidea, but rather called haplorhini and strepsorhini. You may come across that. If you use that taxonomy to answer my questions in the assignment, it's fine. You'll get it right. So if you're confused about that, there's two distinct ways that they've organized it. The basic difference is, is that if you have a tarsier, does anybody have a tarsier for their, for their prosimian? Some kind of tarsier. Okay, tarsiers are included under prosimii, <laughs> but the organization of the, the, the way that, tax, that tarsiers fall into the other classification system is slightly different, but for our purposes, we consider them prosimians. Okay, and you see them listed there. So under prosimians, there are three infraorders, lemuriforms, larissiforms, and tarsiforms. I'm going to go over this today again with slides. So your tarsier is in the infraorder tarsiforms. Okay? Now, you'll note that with the prosimians, they don't extend the lines all the way to the bottom. That's not because they don't go there. There are, of course, species. You've drawn one. They just don't provide you with that information. They only extend the other side of the order all the way down to the species level. And that's because if they did that for everything, the handout would be so big that you couldn't even read it, right? at least if it was 8 by 11. Okay? So anthropoidea, they break down more fully because that's where we are. Okay, and anthropoidea gets broken down into two infraorders, one of which is they're basically divided up by where in the world they live. Platyrines, or members of the infraorder platyrini, live in the New World. Catarines, or, or uh, members of the infraorder catarini, live in the Old World. In the Old World, you have monkeys, apes, and humans. In the New World, you've only got monkeys. Okay, so that's one distinction there. Then you go down another level to superfamily, and you'll notice that, for example, catarines are divided up into old world monkeys and then the apes and humans group. The apes and humans group is called hominoidea. That's over there on the right. We end up with humans way over there on the right, too. Circopithecoidea, which is a big, huge mouthful, is the term that refers to the superfamily of all old world monkeys. Now, note when you go down to the next level below that, 
to the family level, that old world monkey group is called Circopathicidae, okay? This is important to understand. Basically, what's going to happen is, is that the suffix at the end of the Latin word is going to change with each level. So even though you're still talking about all old world monkeys, whether you're talking about the superfamily or the family, the word changes slightly, okay? So the superfamily is called Circopithecoidea. The family is called Circopithecidae. Then when you get down to the subfamily, that's broken into two groups, one of which is colobines, which are leaf monkeys, and then the other one's called Circopithecinae. Okay? So it changes from a D to an N to indicate the subfamily. Circopithecidae becomes Circopithecinae at the subfamily level. Okay? This is important because on the back of your primate assignment, I ask you whether or not your species have a whole bunch of characteristics. And you have to mark an X by the ones that apply to your species. There's a column for your prosimian and a column for your anthropoid. So to give you another piece of advice, if you go down to the fourth one from the bottom up, it says, is your species a circopithecine? Okay, do you see that? That means, is it a member of the subfamily Circopithecinae? Okay? That means that you automatically know that one of your species is not, that is not going to apply to them. Which one? Your prosimian, because a prosimian cannot be Circopithecine. They cannot be. Okay? So any of you who put an X next to a circopithecine under your prosimian column are going to be beaten, okay? I'm going to cry when I read that. Believe me, I cry all the time when I grade papers, but if you do that, I will truly burst into tears. So don't do that because I just gave you the right answer, okay? So we'll get back to the taxonomy in a bit and talk about some of the issues with that. Back to the, back to the assignment. So flip to page two. Let's look at page two. Page two and page three are the same, so we don't need to talk about both of them, or we can talk about both at once. Uh, in Fordham Family, you'll find geographic range and habitat. Remember that I used to ask people, where does it live? And they'd always say, in the trees, which is not what I want. I want geographic range. What countries does it live to live in, and what is its habitat? And please be more specific than forest or trees. Thank you. Uh, estimated population. Note that I say there that this may not be available. Okay, the anal retentive OCD amongst you will end up spending hours looking for this because you believe that it has to be out there when it may not even be available. Think about it for a moment, right? How would you even go about estimating the population of a primate species? How would you figure that out? That's the answer. Awesome. Do you know this or did you just guess that? Oh, that's incredible. You're just my favorite student. Yeah, so basically, if you get on the web, um, does anybody have Bonobo for their anthropoid? Do we have a Bonobo? Okay. You know, I think instead of using your names, I'm just going to call you by the name of the species. From now on, you're Bonobo, okay? It's very nice to meet you. Okay, so when you, let me, get, let me help you with your assignment. When you go on the web, you will, you can search Bonobo population question mark or Pan Paniscus if you use the scientific name. You'll get, you'll find a figure commonly on the web uh, that there are 10,000 Bonobos. Okay, you may find some other figures too, but you may, you'll probably find 10,000 Bonobos really easily. This is bullshit. Okay, there are not 10,000 Bonobos. There are not 10,000 bonobos because this was a guess to begin with, and it's also many years old. But nevertheless, if you put this on your assignment, I will count it as right because it's sort of out there on the internet. And you will find that figure on reliable websites, even though it's really not true if you talk to anybody who's a bonobo specialist, which we actually have a bonobo specialist on our faculty here. Maybe I'll get him to sub for you. He can come and tell you his lurid stories about sexy bonobos. Um, yeah, he, go, he studies bonobos in the Congo, which is where they live in Africa. So 10,000 bonobos is not really correct. How do they get at this figure? Well, what you do is you count. 
well, you can't count every bonobo. That's impossible. So what you do is pick an area that you consider for reasons that you've studied representative of their entire range, and then you extrapolate. You count them in that area, which means that some of the time when you find a population figure for your species, which you're going to be more likely to find for your anthropoid, for reasons I'll explain in a moment, um, you're not going to find a figure like 10,000 bonobos, but you're going to find a figure like uh, 5.3 adult squirrel monkeys per square hectare or acre. It might look like this. And that's fine. Write that in, whatever you find. Uh, but for many species, there's no numbers at all, right? Because imagine, I mean, bonobos are, you know, a bonobo weighs, a bonobo male weighs 100 pounds practically, 90-something pounds probably. They're not, you know, they're shy creatures, bonobos, right? When, when During the war, during the, the war, meaning World War II, right? Not as opposed to all the wars we've been fighting recently. Uh, World War II, when the when the Allies bombed Germany, there were bonobos in uh, I want to say the Hamburg Zoo, but in a German zoo, and they were so frightened by the bombing they all had heart attacks and died. All the chimps, however, survived. Right? The chimps are like top, right? You saw that in the film I showed you, the sex film had that segment where they showed you bonobos and chimps. Bonobos are really, really shy. They're really sweet. They don't scream. They kind of squeak. They're like the kinder, gentler version of chimpanzees. They're pretty shy, so they're not very easy to count, but at least they're big, right? Anything that's small is really hard to count, right? I worked with a primatologist when I was at UCLA. She writes books and stuff. She's like an expert. She got a grant to study uh, a group of monkeys in Central America. They were squirrel monkeys uh, in South America, I'm sorry, that lived on the side of uh, like Incan, like an, like Incan ruins, like the side of a pyramid, say. Uh, and she went out and did the pilot study. They lived in a group of about 80. And she studied them for three months in the jungle. And after three months, she could not, with a pair of binoculars looking up where they lived in this particular ruins, tell the members of the group apart. All right? Because if you're going to do primatology and you're going to study a group, you have to be able to identify the members of the group individually. Okay, This woman is, a, is one of the world's foremost experts on primatology. And after three months, she had to abandon this study because she couldn't tell these little monkeys apart. Right? And they don't come down to the ground. It's much easier to study something that'll, that'll, you know, that, that, that is fine with people, right? Baboons are a piece of cake. There's a ton of information on them. They're obnoxious. They can break into your house, raid your crops, steal things from you. You know, I mean, they're easy to study. They're not afraid of people, and they shouldn't be either. Baboons are badass, man. They are mean. The, ma the males have huge fangs, which you can see, big, huge canine teeth. This is a mandrill. Here's a male. That's what their teeth look like. It's 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 no it's a known fact that on uh, on at least a few occasions that we have documented, a group of baboons, if attacked by a leopard, will mob the leopard and kill it, right? Which a leopard is a pretty formidable animal, believe me. In fact, at night they kill baboons as they're one of their main predators, but in the day, if you get a group of baboons, they will mob the predator. There's a number of primates that do predator mobbing. Right? We could theoretically do this ourselves as an experiment. Right? We'll bring a tiger into the classroom, and then on the count of three, I'll scream, get him, and we'll all just like, <laughs> right? Now, it's an interesting problem. Predator mobbing is an interesting behavioral problem for natural selection, right? Because what would you really do if, I, if there was a tiger in this room and I scream, get him? You'd all run for the door and let it eat me, right? Which makes sense, right? Again, makes perfect sense from natural perspective of natural selection. So predator mobbing is an interesting behavioral question, and we'll get into it. It's an altruistic behavior and a, a defense mechanism, but we'll talk about behavior later when we talk about primates a couple weeks, probably a week and a half. Anyway, so predator mobbing, yeah, they're mean. Baboons are, baboons are tough, as anyone will tell you who lives in Africa in their ranges. So they're easy to study. They're not afraid of people. But anything that's a little tiny thing is going to be afraid of people. Plus, prosimians, which tend to be very small, are by and large nocturnal. Not all of them are. Some lemurs are, are diurnal, meaning they're active during the day, right? You know what nocturnal means. So if something's nocturnal and small, and maybe even solitary, like they kind of live alone, or maybe in small family groups, they become almost impossible to count. 
So I would not urge you to spend hours and hours looking for a population figure for your prosimian if you cannot find it. If it exists and you don't and you don't find it and you leave it blank, yes, you will lose points. If it, if the information is out there and you don't find it, that's how you lose points. But if the information exists for that and you don't find it and you leave it blank or say not available, you're going to lose one point. Okay, so is one point worth six hours of searching on the web? I don't think so. Okay, and you need to get over your OCD problem. Okay, go see a specialist. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so uh, then I asked for its level of endangerment. You may be unaware that um, endangered organisms, animals are, are ranked. There's a ranking system, and levels of endangerment vary. You can be threatened, or you can be you know, critically endangered, essentially, anywhere in between. It's a whole range. So I want you to find that, and I want you to tell me what the rating organization is. One place that you can find that very easily is on the web. If you just search for, uh, or just put into your, your address uh, bar field, uh, redlist.org. Redlist.org is a, Redlist is an organization that maintains a list of all the endangerment levels of all species in the world. And if you have the scientific name, you just put that into the search engine, it'll tell you everything you need to know about its endangerment level. Average social group size and composition. Um, that's how big the group is, what the ratio is of males and females, and offspring, if you can find that. Diet, pretty straightforward. Include all major foods eaten, beginning with the most important, provide percentages if possible. I really recommend for that information, you look in the row book. It's got good information on diet. The row book has a lot of the answers for you. If, don't, you know, run, don't walk to get your row book information and photocopy the page or whatever you're going to do. Okay? Uh, it's a big green book. I usually bring it in to show you. I don't have it right here, but it's a big green book. It's got a picture of a chimp on the front of it, and they have two copies over in the lab, and you can make photocopies of the pages for a dime a page. It will have somewhere between one-third and one-half of the answers you need. Yeah, probably about a third, but that's more than you're going to find it on any given site on the web. So don't – I mean, I know that you <coughs> – I know that you don't read books anymore, that your generation just looks at the Internet. You probably don't even know what a book is. It's sort of like the Internet, but it's made of paper. I, I, you know, it's, I, that's why I bring it in to hold it up, just to remind you what they are. It's a book, kids. Um, so, yeah, do the row book. Trust me. I'm, it's, it's good advice. Average life expectancy, please specify captivity or wild. Why would I care about that? There's a big difference. What's the difference? Captivity. Captivity lives a lot longer unless there's unless you can't live in captivity unless you're unless you're like this ET guy here, this one here, um, which is a red sh shanked dock longer from Vietnam and they die in captivity practically immediately mainly because they're very fussy about the food they eat and you can't replicate their diet if you're outside of Vietnam. So if you're in Vietnam, you can actually keep them in captivity, but you've got to do a lot of work collecting the right food for them. You can't just throw a bowl full of monkey chow into the cage, you know, which you can for some of these guys will eat anything they can get their little hands on, right? Um, baboons would, you know, the, they'll eat anything. Baboons will eat anything. I'll show you. I'll show you a film actually, um, probably, probably on Monday, um, where baboons hunt and eat flamingos in Africa. They're amazing. Baboons are so adaptable. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. You're going to have to watch a flamingo get torn apart and consumed by a baboon. Um, Nature is an ugly place, baby. Uh, major predators, you can include humans if you want, but give me some other examples too. You're going to do the same thing for the prosimian species. The second page is exactly the same. Flip to the back. The back is the hardest part. The back will require you to be familiar with certain traits behavioral and morphological that primates have, and it's my intention that you understand the concepts that are listed here. So these traits and ideas and concepts will show up on your test, and hopefully the fact that you've done this assignment will help you know what the answers are when we get to the test. So you're going to place an X in the space next to the following traits that are part of each of your species' morphology or behavior. Behaviors and traits must be generally true, not simply true some of the time. 
Okay. So if you notice at the very bottom there, I say, does it regularly, meaning frequently or usually, give birth to twins? Right? Human beings under natural conditions without fertility drugs would give birth to twins in about one out of 80 births. That's the human twin rate. That would not be sufficient for you to mark this if humans were your anthropoid. Okay? Humans are not your anthropoid. I don't assign humans, but just if I did, you would not mark that box for humans because one in 80 is not frequently or usually. Okay. What's that? Well, the thing is, is I would say in the question, this is a very good point, I would say in the question more than 40% of the time or something, but that's not how you're going to find it. Right? You're going to find usually or frequently or one of these types of adverbs regularly. So if you can find something that says something like that, then that's fine. Right? Basically, I, I know a lot of this stuff for many of these species, but I assign between my two classes about 150 different species of primates. Do I have all this information in my head for every single primate species? Well, I wish I was that smart, but I'm not. So what I have is a big, huge, fat database that has every possible answer to every question on this thing. And you turn your paper in, and me or my assistant will grade it. My assistant or I will grade it. And you know, if your answer is not something that's in the database, right? the database will say that you know, um, tufted ear marmosets frequently give birth to twins, yes. OK? Let's say you don't mark that, even though you have a tufted ear marmoset for your species, right? And now, of course, you'll be called tufted ear marmoset for the rest of the semester because that's now your name. Uh, if you don't mark that and it's marked in the database, if you can produce a reliable website or source that shows your answer is correct, then what I will do is modify my database and give you the credit. I'm going to mark it wrong when it's not on the database. But if you can come back to me and say, hey, look, I found this website that says that this is true. And I will say, OK, uh, that's great. Here's some points. Or I will say, no, that website is crap. Or I will say, no, you have misread that website, and that's not really what it's saying. Right? There's several possibilities. You may not get the points. But what I'm saying, and this is important because you should remember where you get your information. I don't require sources. You do not have to give me sources. You only have to give me the answers. But you should remember where you got your information and or hang on to your row book photocopies. You're not going to have any conflicts with the row book because they're all incorporated in the database. But save a list of the websites you use or some history in your computer so you know where those websites are, because if I give it back to you and you want to appeal your grade, you can, but I require that you give me the documentation. You can't just say, I found this on the web. It's like, I need a printout of where you found it, right? So that's how that'll work. But I would put a percentage down for the twins, except that's not what you're going to find when you do the research. So look for words like frequently or usually, and if that's the case, then mark the box, OK? Yeah. Um, but if you end up with numbers, let's say 10% and higher, that would be fine, 10% and higher. Um, if your answers are not clear, I will mark them wrong, OK? Um, if you want to use a yes-no system, right? So let's, you're going through this, right? I say put an x in the space for either your prosimian or anthropoid if they actually have the trait, right? Well, I just told you that there's no way your anthropoid could be a circopithecine, right? Maybe you won't remember that I even said that when you finally get around to doing the assignment, but for your own purposes, if you want to put like an N next to circopithecine for prosimian, and, and that way you'll know you have an answer, that's fine. If you turn this in with Ys and Ns for yes and no, that's fine. It doesn't have to be an X as long as I can figure the system out. If you do X's, then leave the ones that they don't have blank. If you do yeses and nos, do Y and Ns or yes and no. Okay. So in other words, you can deviate from the instruction. It's fine as long as I can figure out what it is you're doing. So what do I want to know? I want to know if your species contains subspecies within the species. Okay. Now again, there are taxonomic debates. You may find conflicting information. One source may tell you that no, there are no subspecies for your vervet monkey. 
and another source may tell you that there are. In that case, if there are sources that say both things, then you can't miss the question. You can put yes or no, and there's no way I'll mark it wrong, okay, if there's a conflict or a debate. So you're safe if there's a debate. Uh, does it have a prehensile tail? Does anyone know what that means? Do they teach you that on your tour? What does prehensile tail mean? It means it can support your body weight when you hang from it, okay? Um, does it have an average intermembral index of greater than 90? Who the hell knows what that is? None of you. I'll explain it in a future lecture. Does it have a rhinarium? Does it have a 2133, 2133 dental pattern? Does it have a tapetum lucidum? Does it have a catarine nose? Does it have claws instead of nails on any digits? What's the difference between claws and nails? Does anybody know? Claws are sharper is the answer. You got competition for my favorite student of the day award. Yeah. A lot of people think it's that, it, that claws can retract or they're, they're internal or, you know, all these different things, which are characteristic of some claws. But all it is is that a claw comes to a point and a nail is flat. That's it. Yes? So people that sharpen their nails, do they have claws now? Or? No, it's naturally. Naturally, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, yeah. You can go to the manicurist all you want, but you're still only going to have nails. Some primates have claws instead of nails. Some only have a claw instead of a nail on one single digit, okay? If that's the case, then mark yes. That's why I say instead of nails on any digits, okay? Does it have a dental comb? A dental comb is a very interesting adaptation found among some primates where your bottom row of teeth sticks forward, and then you can use it to comb and clean your fur. Right? Imagine how useful this would be, ladies. You could keep your hair clean by simply chewing on it, right? Save lots of time and effort. We do not have this feature, however. Uh, do you have ischial callosities? It's a fancy word for pads on your butt. Female phylopetry will be explained in a future lecture. Is it fully arboreal? And here I did give you a number, meaning more than 90% of the time in the trees. Is it nocturnal? Is it a circopithecine? Is it sexually dichromatic or dimorphic? Is it a vertical clinger and leaper? And finally, does it regularly, meaning frequently or usually, give birth to twins? Okay. There you go. Any questions? Yes. Primate mod. Uh, they're under a, yeah, they're under the primate module. Yeah, they're under the primate module. Should be where they are. <laughs> it's been a while since I put it up, but it's there. Okay, so remember, you guys have a later due date. My other class did not benefit by that because they're ahead. See? See, it's good to be behind. Gave you extra time to finish this assignment. Huh, interesting that. All right, any other questions? Let's start talking about primates. Here's a bunch of primates. Well, here's three anyway. Uh, do you know any of these primates? I mean, not personally. Can you recognize the species or no? Japanese monkeys are where? On the far right. They call them snow monkeys, too, so that's kind of a little bit of a giveaway because they're covered in snow. Uh, great. Yes, that's good. And either of the others? The left one is a type of lemur called a shifaka, which you saw at the zoo, actually. This one's called a diadem shifaka, which refers to that little dark patch on top of its head. A diadem is like a crown. And the one in the middle? What's that? Any idea? It's a monkey. Good. It is a monkey. Excellent. In fact, the right two are both monkeys. Okay. Uh, the left one is a lemur. And the left one looks like, you know, the little cartoon guys in Madagascar, so you probably could have guessed from Uh The middle one comes from where? Any ideas? Nope. Africa. Africa. Of course, it could be Asia, Africa, or South America, but we got it in two tries. It is a red colobus monkey. 
which are hunted as prey by chimpanzees, actually. Um, you'll also see that in a film, I think, unless we run out of time. It's pretty disgusting, actually, watching a bunch of chimps tear apart a poor colobus monkey. But you know, nature's a horrible place, and I'm here, the, I'm here to teach you that. All right. Here is the primate fact sheet. That is a crested Sulawesi macaque, which became an instant internet sensation when it apparently, according to the photographer, took his camera away from him and shot its own picture. That's what he claims. And there are several other photos that went along with it. But apparently that monkey took that picture himself. I'm a little bit skeptical, but I'm a little bit skeptical about everything. I'm quite skeptical about the recent claims that this woman was raised by monkeys, which is now going around on the web, like Tarzan, or any of the other sort of feral wild child stories that all turn out to be bullshit when you look at them closely. Excuse me. I promised I was going to stop swearing so much. I have a chronic problem. So there are about 400 different species of primates. Uh, that keeps going up, partly because new ones get discovered. There was a new discovery last year of a Gwenon in Africa, uh, actually this year. And um, it's also the case that sometimes uh, groups that were previously thought to be a single species will be split in half because then people will realize that they're not the same species. They don't reproduce with one another. At this point, if you include subspecies classification, there are about 658 groups, or taxa, to use the right word. Generally speaking, primates are generalists. And you remember what that means, because we talked about you know, generalized versus specialized adaptations. They range in size between one ounce for Bertha's mouse lemur, which somebody might have as their prosimian. Does anyone have Bertha's mouse lemur? All right. Listen, you're batting a thousand today. Um, maybe I'll call you Bertha's mouse lemur. <laughs> um, to 440 pounds for an eastern lowland gorilla, average uh, adult male weight. That's the biggest one. Um, almost all are arboreal, and almost all are tropical. You saw one exception to the tropical, and that's the snow monkey. There's a few others in China, but most of them come from the tropics. You can see that on this map, which shows you the range of primates that are living at this point in dark brown and fossilized primates that have been discovered in this kind of cream color. Note that we have fossilized primates that have been discovered in the United States, but no monkeys or would-be monkeys in the New World, primates in general, live there at this point. The furthest north primates live in the New World is actually southern Mexico. I taught this class for about 10 years before I finally got down to Nicaragua and actually saw primates in the wild. It was very exciting a couple years ago. Um, I saw howler monkeys and spider monkeys and capuchins um, down there. Um, let's see. What else can I tell you? The places that are cream-colored, uh, used to be tropical. That's the main, like places like Europe, you're kind of, you know, the idea like, okay, there were primates in Europe, but that's because the temperature used to be warmer, and that's what allowed for that. The northernmost primates live in Japan, where that one species that you saw lives. This is the primate order. You have this as a handout. Good thing, too, because you probably can't even read this. Um, we've talked about that briefly. All right, one thing to say about primates is, is that about half of all primate species are endangered. There are a couple different reasons why they're endangered. The number one reason they're endangered is habitat destruction. Did your zoo tour guides talk about endangerment at all? Or human impact on the environment and how that's affecting primates? Anybody have anybody say anything about that? Interesting. You'll get a big dose of this when you go to the Gibbon Center, because Gibbons, who are little apes that live in uh, Asia, are under a great deal of stress from habitat destruction. Deforestation, for a number of reasons, one of the main reasons is to uh, uh, they deforest to plant um, palm to grow, uh, to produce palm oil in Indonesia is the main place that's happening. 
So palm oil is a really uh, important export for Indonesia. It's found in all kinds of products. You might have it in your shampoo, for example. And when you go to the Gibbon Center, the people there who are very concerned with the conservation of given species will urge you to not use products with palm oil in them because it's not good for these animals. They're losing their habitats because of it. Um, deforestation happens for other reasons too. Obviously, wood is one of the main ones, fuel or various things that wood's used for. Uh, the bushmeat trade, which is what's shown in the picture, is also another major reason why primates are endangered. Uh, this is a guy in Madagascar who has just successfully hunted the largest of all the lemurs, which is a, uh, a creature called an indri. Uh, and in fact, its scientific name is indri indri, which is kind of useful. We, we like simple scientific names. The simplest scientific name of all is gorilla, gorilla, gorilla. Um, if only scientific names in general are that easy. The Indri got its scientific name because when white people got to Madagascar, they asked local people what that noise was. This creature is very loud, like a lot of primates. It calls out to its friends. And it makes a sound that's sort of like, whoop, 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 sounds like a, like a siren, right? <laughs> They're really loud. You can hear them for probably a mile away. So the white people get to Madagascar and they say, hey, what's that sound? And the Malagasy people, which is the name of the people that live on Madagascar, point up to the trees and they say, Indri, Indri. And that's now its scientific name. Turns out that in Malagasy, Indri actually means there it is, right? So that's its name. I refer to it as the whoop, there it is primate in honor of my favorite song. <laughs> but this one did not quite fare too well. It was killed. They're in danger. They're in trouble. Deforestation is the main thing. And in Madagascar, there's 90 plus percent of the island has been deforested, mainly to grow uh, rice, rice farming is what people do in Madagascar. Um, and that's, that's really been difficult because all the lemurs that are still alive live in trees. Um, so yeah, but this is a bushmeat. This is what bushmeat is. People hunt primates to eat them. And this happens in Africa, it happens in South America. Um, and it does happen in Asia as well, although it's, it's secondary as a problem in Asia. Uh, finally, the pet trade. Some people turn primates into pets. This is very popular for anything that's small. South America's got a lot of small monkey species. You probably saw some of them. They're called marmosets and tamarins. And they are frequently imported or exported from South American countries and imported into the United States as pets. It is not a good idea to have a primate as a pet. Okay, I just want to say this. Some make better pets than others, but almost all of them are very difficult to keep in captivity, partly because they start out really cute, but then they get bigger, and then finally they become adult, and then they want to mate with you. And that's not so good. So if you have a male primate, even a little male capuchin monkey or a squirrel monkey, will probably start humping your leg, particularly if you're female, once it matures. And what happens is a lot of people have primates as pets, but then when they become adults, they have to get rid of them, so they have to take them off to a, you know, to a pet sanctuary or a primate sanctuary or something like this. The pet trade is intense. 5,000 monkeys are confiscated in the LA Harbor annually off of boats coming from South America. 5,000 a year, right? So there's a, there's a big problem with this. Um, one creature that has a big problem with the pet trade is the orangutan, which is frequently kept, this is the orangutan down here, is frequently kept as a pet in Southeast Asia. Okay. The problem with that is, is that as babies, they're very smart and they make good pets, but they get up to more than 200 pounds when they're adult. And so people get rid of them when they're adults as well. And then they have to be put on, they're, they're put in sanctuaries too and kind of live outdoors, but they have to be fed because they've never learned how to feed themselves naturally when they're in captivity. Right? The orangutans are the longest period of dependency on their parents of any primate other than human beings. And, and, and the baby orangutan spends six plus years, six to eight years, learning how to feed themselves in the wild by copying their, their mother, basically. And when they, you know, people want babies as pets, right? It's like people want puppies. It's the same thing. So the way they get captured for the pet trade, and you can go to a marketplace in Java and, you know, in, in, in Indonesia and find them for sale, 
oftentimes they're like in the back of the little shops because it's really illegal to sell them to people do anyway. Uh, when they capture them for the pet trade, a person goes out to the forest with a gun, finds a mother and an offspring, shoots the mother with the gun, and hopes that when the mother falls dead out of the tree that she does not land on the baby on the ground because if she does, it will kill the baby. But usually the mother lands under the baby and then they take the baby and sell the baby as a pet, which means that for every single pet that you get in the pet trade in Indonesia that's an orangutan, another orangutan has died for that, that one to get to the pet trade. Not only that, but the one that's died is a fertile adult female, which as you know from an evolutionary perspective is by far the most important member of a species, right? And that, my friends, is why they're down to eh, probably about 5,000 uh, orangutans live in the wild now in Sumatra, and about 13,000 live on the island of Borneo. So orangutans are in big trouble, actually. Uh, and the main thing that's driving them is some habitat destruction, because they need the forest too, but also the pet trade. OK, so let's talk a little bit about the different groups of primates. These are all prosimians. Uh, and the prosimians include three different subgroups, okay? These are ringtail lemurs. You probably saw them at the zoo. This is a bush baby, which is a f really fast, spastic, nocturnal animal. It's very difficult to study because it moves too quick through the forest, and it's active at night, lives in Africa. And this is what's called a podo, which is an African slow-moving, quadrupedal, arboreal creature that sort of eats birds' eggs and things like that. They probably would get predated and eaten by all kinds of predators themselves, but they're nocturnal, and no being nocturnal is a way you protect yourself from predators. Uh, and also they stink, apparently. People always say, if you, if you do research, does anybody draw Poto? Does anybody have Poto? Nobody gets called Poto for the rest of the semester? Too bad, I like that one. It sounds like a pet name you might give your girlfriend or boyfriend. But potos, potos always are described in the literature as having a curry-like odor that supposedly deters predators. It's just like, well, that doesn't make any sense. I love curry, right? <laughs> so I was, in, I was in England when I took my students on study abroad. We went to Oxford. I had them all go to the London Zoo. Like, we went to the LA Zoo. We went to the London Zoo on a field trip. And they have this fantastic, at the London Zoo, they have this fantastic nocturnal uh, exhibit like you go down underground in this exhibit hall and it's really dark and every cage is dark and everything's lit by infrared light and you see all these nocturnal creatures. And they had a poto. I was so excited. I'd never seen a poto in person. Like, and no zoo have, has them. And there was a poto there. And of course it was really boring because they move really slow. I mean, they're, they, they, you know, they walk sort of like this along the branches and they kind of sneak slowly up on whatever it is they try and eat. But they never move quickly. But I actually did see the poto. And then the zookeeper came out, and we started talking about the poto. I'm so excited. It's amazing what excites me. This really excited me. And I had a chance to ask him, what about that curry-like odor, I asked him. I was like, is it really true that they have a curry-like odor? And he just laughed. He said, if that's true, it's the worst curry I've ever smelled. Right? So apparently they stink so bad that nothing eats them. Okay, so one suborder of primates is the prosimians, and it's composed of lemurs, loruses, and tarsiers, or actually more accurately, lemuriforms, lorisiforms, and tarsiforms. This information is on your taxonomy, but if you want to put it in your notes, that's great. Lemurs, loruses, and tarsiers are all, and their relatives, are all confined to Old World, meaning Asia and Africa, and all lemurs live on Madagascar unless they've been hauled off to a zoo somewhere like L.A. Originally, naturally, they all live on Madagascar. There used to be many more lemurs on Madagascar, too. One of the amazing things about Madagascar is that it wasn't inhabited by people until probably close to 1000 A.D. But then when people got there, the animals on Madagascar, like animals where people don't live in general, were really friendly. There were big, huge, sloth-like lemurs that weighed 250 pounds that lived on the ground. We have their bones, right? And they probably didn't think twice about people. They had no natural predator enemies on their island, so they were living life pretty well. People showed up. They probably greeted them, 
right? Hi, welcome to Madagascar. I'm a 250-pound lemur. Why don't you eat me for dinner? And that's exactly what people did. <laughs> the trusting, nice, big, fat, ground-dwelling lemurs were all eaten like popcorn by the people that arrived at the island and instantly went extinct. There's a, probably at least two or three dozen species of extinct lemurs. The ones that have survived are the little guys that live in the trees that people can't kill. They're cute and fuzzy and make nice stuffed animals. I don't mean like a real one. They also have big eyes. People always think things are cute that have big eyes. Like babies have bigger eyes compared to the size of their head than adults, and we think they're really cute. So whenever you have a creature that has really big eyes like this, people are always like, oh, that's so cute. Right? <laughs> big eyes and big head, that's what cute means. Hello Kitty syndrome. Some facts about prosimians. This is their family tree. Don't worry about it, but it's just there for an illustration. Um, they are the most primitive of all primates. What does that mean? Well, in biology, the word primitive, and actually the preferred term really at this point, is ancestral. Primitive equals ancestral. And basically, when you hear a, a, you know, an evolutionary biologist use a phrase like primitive or ancestral, what they mean is that it is closer to the ancestral form. Yeah, they have the least that's changed about them since a long time ago. That's what that means. So, you know... Um, if, you know, humans and chimpanzees are closely related. We know this from genetics, et cetera. So at some point in the distant past, the estimated time is between about six and seven million years ago, humans and chimps have a common ancestor. All evidence indicates that this common ancestor is more chimp-like than human-like, meaning that compared to humans, chimps are more primitive. That's what this means. The opposite of primitive or ancestral is derived, which means that stuff's changed. So, for example, you would say that bipedalism in human beings is a derived trait. We don't share it with any other primates. None of them do it except for us. So it's something that's changed in our lineage. That's a derived trait. And in general, we are more derived as a species. There's more about humans that have changed. A lot of major things have changed about us, particularly our brains. Walking on two legs is great, but I gladly trade away walking on two legs to keep my big brain. Think about that. So, primate, uh, prosimians have a number of characteristics. They have a reliance on sense of smell, the term for that is olfaction, that is greater than, um, than the anthropoids' reliance on smell. Anthropoids use smell as less significant for them. They have laterally placed eyes, which means they have like beady little eyes that are close together. They have shorter gestation and maturation periods, so they, they get born quicker and grow up faster than their anthropoid cousins. And some of them, some lemurs, but not all lemurs, so you're going to have to look this up for the assignment, have what's called a dental comb. There's a number of other things that distinguish prosimians from anthropoids, but that's just a couple of traits. Yeah, well, no, dental combs you don't find in everybody. So that one you'll have to look up because not all of them have it. A lot of the characteristics, one point I'll tell you a piece of advice about the assignment. A lot of the characteristics that I list on the back of the assignment pattern within the primate order. So I'll ask about something, and what you might not, you might not find that your species has it, but you might find that it's true of a whole group of primates, and then you've got to determine whether or not your species is in that group. That's how you figure it out. That's another piece of advice for you. Okay. Now, lemurs are the main group of prosimians that people are familiar with. 
and probably because they've been the stars of several movies. Uh, the word lemur uh, comes from the Latin word ghost, and that's, again, because of the sound they make, not the way they look. Not all of them make noises like that, but a lot of them do, some form of that. They all live on Madagascar. Lemurs are both diurnal and nocturnal, depends on the species. There are no prosimians that aren't lemurs that aren't nocturnal. There's a triple negative for you. There ain't no lemur, there ain't no prosimians that aren't no lemurs that aren't nocturnal. Meaning that every non-lemur prosimian is in fact nocturnal. And yeah, lemurs are both. So you have to, if you have a lemur, because remember I asked if it's nocturnal, your species is nocturnal on the assignment. If you have a lemur, you have to look it up and research it. But if you don't have a lemur for your prosimian, then you have something that is not, that is definitely nocturnal. Because everybody else is nocturnal, except for some lemurs. Okay. The really cute members of our little family group are the lorises, bush babies, potos, and galagos. This is a galago here. So cute, I want one. I want to eat it. I want to eat it on a sandwich for lunch. So tasty. You couldn't catch one if you tried. They're pretty quick, actually, galagos. Um, but they're super cute. Uh, the scary, frightening members of the prosimians are called tarsiers. And tarsiers eat a diet that's almost entirely consists of animal material. Uh, they eat a lot of insects, but they've actually been documented as eating birds. They kick off. They are what's called vertical clingers and leapers. They start vertical like this, and they use their very powerful hind legs with its elongated ankle bone, which is called a tarsus, and that's how they get their name, tarsier, to kick off of the branch they're on, and then they will twirl in midair and land vertically on another tree. They're capable of leaping well over 15 feet, up to about 20, and they are about the size of your fist. They're extremely fast as well. It's been documented that they've caught a bird in midair. They're voracious little monsters. They're like a cross between a shark and a hamster on acid. <laughs> and we are just lucky that they don't weigh 300 pounds because if they did, they would eat us and we would all be killed. They're voracious. Their eyes don't move in their head, so they have to rotate their head, which they can do to about 180 degrees, practically, like they're possessed by Satan. <laughs> and I actually think they are. Each of their eyes is huge. Right? You can always tell a nocturnal creature because whenever you look at a photograph of them, they look like this, right? And you think, damn, they must have been like, you know, they must have this flash for like three days, right, before they sort of like manage to get it right. But they can't move their eyes in their head, and each of their individual eyes is so large it weighs more than their brain. <laughs> They're just little eating machines. Nothing will stop them. Um, they have a few natural predators, like nocturnal birds of prey, like owls and stuff. They live in Southeast Asia. They're actually doing fairly well, even with deforestation, because you know an orangutan, for example, being a much larger creature, requires a much larger area of forest, whereas a tarsier, being really small, can actually live in a pretty small patch of forest. And nobody wants to eat them because they're too hard to catch and they're only active at night, so nobody's hunting them for food. They're, they're amazing little creatures. Uh, part two is the anthropoids. And here we have some anthropoids. Recognize any of those guys? Orangutan is which one? Bottom right. Anything else? Uh, close. It's a Sykes monkey, which is a relative that lives in Africa. Is this the one you meant? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, it's very, they're very baboon looking. Know what this is? Lions aren't primates, actually. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a gibbon. That's what you're going to see at the gibbon center. That's a Mueller's gibbon from Southeast Asia. And this is a common squirrel monkey, which is found throughout Latin America. Little tiny guy. This is a big victim of the pet trade, this guy. So anthropoids include monkeys, apes, and humans. 
They are divided into the New World group, which are platyrines, and the Old World group, which includes monkeys, apes, and humans, catarines. So you only find, mon only find monkeys in the New World. Apes and humans get grouped together into a group called hominoids. Please don't confuse that with hemorrhoids. <laughs> I mean, or do, it's fine. I don't think I'll be putting hemorrhoids as a possible answer on the test. I'm not that bad. Or maybe I am, but I won't do that. There are a lot more species of anthropoids than there are of prosimians. And they are more derived and less primitive and smarter and more effective. Anywhere on Earth that you find prosimians and anthropoids coexisting, the prosimians are always nocturnal. And what becoming nocturnal allows you to do is survive in the face of stiff daytime competition. Because if you go nocturnal, your species evolves a nocturnal behavioral pattern. That means that you don't have to compete with all those, that stuff that's awake during the day. And if prosimians had to compete with anthropoids on a head-to-head on a -head basis, they would, they would lose because they're not as smart, they're not as adaptable, they're not as strong. Being more primitive in this case is something that, you know, is, is a strike. In a sense, monkeys are better adapted than prosimians. And the reason why we have a bunch of prosimians on Madagascar is because that's isolated and there's no anthropoids there, at least until people arrive, but not counting people. So there's no monkeys on Madagascar, just prosimians. And that's the reason why they've kind of flourished. Not a lot of predators either. In fact, one of the main predators for lemurs is this thing called a fossa. Did you see that at the zoo? Yeah, in fact, they're really, it's so weird. They put the fossa right across from the lemurs, which I think must make the lemurs kind of go insane because they have to look across and see their main predator all day long. Meanwhile, the fossa just like paces back and forth in its cage, like, you know, it must be nuts to eat some lemur, right? <laughs> Fossas are nasty little weasel-like creatures, actually. They can climb trees. New World monkeys are the infra order of platyrrhini. Their range is shown there. This is a spider, a black spider monkey doing something that only New World primates can do, which is what? Hang from his tail. Only some of them can hang from their tail. One semester I asked that question and somebody said, drink water? <laughs> <laughs> I write down all the cute answers people say in my classes. No, honey, all primates can drink water. <laughs> it's hanging by its tail. Oh, that's right. Yeah, hopefully you didn't think it was right side up. Here's some photos of platyrines, uh, some of which you've seen. Who'd you see at the zoo? See any of them? Here? Saw this guy? You see this guy? Capuchin? Capuchins are famous because they're like the stars of movies and TV. Ace Ventura, what else have they been in? Friends. Friends. Everything pretty much, yes. All of the above would be the right answer on the test. What did you say? Californication, Californication yes. Uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. They're the crazy monkey in Pirates of the Caribbean. Who else? Jumanji. Yeah, Jumanji and Outbreak. Oh, yeah. They were the they were the monkey in Outbreak. Although in Outbreak, they say the monkey that causes the outbreak comes from Africa, which is wrong. They come from South America. So every primatologist that saw Outbreak was just like, bullshit. <laughs> <You know. laughs> It's not, it doesn't come from Africa, they come from, they're South American. Uh, it's about the outbreak of a virus that the monkey carries. Yeah, it's not worth watching. <laughs> You've got better things to do with your time. Sorry, what was the name of the top right? This is an emperor tamarin, which is the tamarins and marmosets are the little group of monkeys in South America, the tiny guys that are all about one to two pounds. Um, this is a bald wakari, which looks like that, sort of like my uncle who drinks too much <laughs> <laughs> with high blood pressure or something. Yeah. So why do you use the same monkey for pretty much every movie or TV show? Is it like easy to do? Yes, they're easy to train. In fact, you know, my, my cousin used to work with the program. The, the, the best thing about these guys, I mean, it's neat that they're in the movies, but yeah, they're really, really smart. In fact, this is the smartest small primate. They have the largest brain 
to body size ratio of anything other than humans. They also have documented tool use, which is really unusual for monkeys. Baboons use tools. These guys use tools. And then most of the rest of the tool users are apes. Apes are smarter. Um, and they're really intelligent. They're big victims of the pet trade as well. But they actually train them to help uh, quadriplegics and paraplegics. Like if you're paralyzed, you can train these monkeys to like go to your kitchen and bring you food. So they, they're, they're like guide dogs for people who are paralyzed. What's that? How, much is it to get one? How easy is it? How much is it? Uh, well, it's not legal to have one <laughs> unless you have a special permit, which they'll give you if you're paralyzed. But um, I, I'm not sure. Like on the so-called black market, how much would it cost you? Uh, yeah, I would say probably more than a grand, maybe a few grand. Yeah, a few grand. But if you go down to South America, you can you can get them cheap. Then you've got to smuggle them back into the country, which they just busted that woman for, like, trying to hide a monkey in, on a plane. <laughs> like, she was wearing a coat, and underneath it there were, like, three monkeys. I love that story. <laughs> <laughs> this guy here? Yeah. Bald Wakari. So uh, you said mammals are likely to have their brains overheat. That's why we have hair. Yeah. So why is that, like, the opposite? Uh, it doesn't live in its environment is exposed to sun. So it stays, it's under trees all the time. Swims a lot, too, that one. There's seasonal swamps in its area, and it'll swim to get away or get to, like, an island or something that's separated by water. So, yeah, so he, um, he's, in, he's under the trees all the time. These are spiders. I saw those in Central America. I saw this guy in Central America. This is the smallest monkey in the world, which is a pygmy marmoset. And you'll see, uh, what's that? No, one ounce is, a, is, a, is the mouse lemur. This weighs about less than a pound, probably about 10 ounces is my recollection. They're bigger. The lemurs are really tiny. Lemurs, some of the smallest lemurs are very, very small. This is a howler monkey, the one that lies around and howls and makes all kinds of noise, and I saw those too. You hear them if you go down to southern Mexico. Has anybody seen primates in the wild? Where did you see them? Uh huh. And which, did you see howlers? Heard them, yeah, you hear them everywhere, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. Because they eat leaves. Anything that eats all leaves takes a big crap. Like my friend, the vegetarian, she takes huge craps. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, howlers, howlers, anything that eats leaves is like inherently lazy. No offense to the vegetarians. But like in the natural world, leaves don't have a lot of nutrition. So that means you've got to spend a lot of your time eating and then you kind of lie around all the time. And instead of fighting, what they do is howl because it doesn't take any effort. Most of the time, they sleep half the day. The other half, they just eat leaves, 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 leaves. Gorillas are the same way. They don't move around too much. They eat a lot of leaves, right? Sir? But they never get big, no matter how much they eat? Well, this is a pretty big monkey, actually. Oh, they, they get, yeah, these guys get 20 pounds. That's, that's the biggest monkey. And this is the, mm, let me think, Derek. Da, 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 da. I think the murky is a little bit bigger. But this is close to the largest primate in, the, in Latin America. Close. They're big. Did you see howlers at the zoo? They do have howlers at the zoo, right? Are they black or are they orange? They were black. They were black, okay, because they come in two colors. Um, okay. Um, old world monkeys, apes, <laughs> and humans uh, shown here. It was a close relative of this guy that was discovered recently. Not this particular species, but a close relative. It's called an owl monkey. Lives in Africa. This is a chimp, and this is hopefully the last Republican president we'll ever have. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I don't really teach political science anyway. Do I know what I'm doing? No. All right. Old world monkeys include the super family Cercopithecoidea. Note on your handout, your taxonomy, that Cercopithecoidea is divided up into who? We touched on this briefly. What two groups is Cercopithecoidea made up of? Cercopithecines or Cercopithecinae, and what's the other group called? Uh, Colobinae. Colobines are leaf-eating monkeys, and this is one of them. That's a Hanuman Langer from India, which are sacred to Hindus, actually. Um, you're not, they have, if, if a, uh, there's a whole temple dedicated to them, and in fact, Hanuman is a god in Hinduism um, who created the monkeys. And when he created the monkeys, the Hindus say that he dropped the monkey into the fire 
and it burned its face and its hands, and that's why they have black hands and a black face. That's what they say. Um, yeah, Hanuman and the Hanuman monkey army figure prominently in one of the most important pieces of literature in Hinduism, which is called the Ramayana. Uh, anyway, there's a little side note for you. Yeah, they're really smart, and they, um, they, they break into your house, too. They'll, they'll, they'll steal food from people on the street. Uh, and you're not allowed to do anything to them because they're sacred. That's a, it's a good to be a Hanuman Lanar, actually. And if they get killed, like if one of them gets hit by a car, devout Hindus will hold a funeral for them, right? Like a, per, a human funeral for the monkey because they're, they're that cool. Uh, here's some platyrines. Some of them are quite beautiful. Here's your red shank Doc Longer. That's the same guy here as E.T. Uh, from Vietnam. This is Rafiki from The Lion King, uh, also known as a mandrel, which you saw that at the zoo too, right? Yeah. No, they're super shy, but they're the biggest monkey there is. Males weigh 80 pounds. They're, big, they're, they're, they're related to baboons. You can see that they look somewhat like them, but they're the biggest one. And they're, but they're shy. They actually don't like people, even though the males have big teeth. They don't, they're a little bit shy creatures. Um, males have colorful faces and females don't. It's one of those dimorphic traits. Uh, and this is, you saw this too, right? A black and white colobus. Yeah, the beautiful creature this is. They were hunted to near extinction in the 1920s because there was a big craze for monkey fur coats in, in Europe and the U.S. And everybody wanted to wear a monkey fur coat. That was like a really cool thing. They all disintegrated because bugs ate them. But if you can find one today, it's worth a fortune. It's also illegal. So if you go home and there's a monkey fur coat in your attic, it's actually worth thousands of dollars, but you can't sell it on eBay because it violates restrictions on animal sales. Now they've come back, but they got hunted to near oblivion because people love their fur so much. Um, yeah, oh, and this is a, this is a uh, golden snub-nosed monkey from China, which they had at the zoo for a while as a visiting exhibit, but they're not there now. Super cute little guys with blue faces. They live in the cold weather, too. Uh, that leads us to apes and humans. There's me at the prom in high school. I'm on the right. <laughs> Here's the infra order. I'm sorry, yes, the, the, the super family, hominoidea. Uh, lesser apes are gibbons and siamongs. All the rest of these are great apes or humans. They call the gibbons and siamongs lesser apes because they're small. Gibbons average less than 20 pounds. The largest of them is the siamong, which you saw at the zoo as well. Probably was making lots of noise when you saw it. Um, this is an orangutan. This is a western lowland gorilla. This is Bonobo, Madonna, and Child. And then this is just this woman I saw on the street somewhere. <laughs> it, it is Paris Hilton. That was a joke. <laughs> It's very seldom. Yeah, that's my mother. Um, now, nobody's actually proved that it exists, but if they ever do, Bigfoot would actually have to be a primate. So I can tell you that no person on Earth, well, there's one person on Earth, would be more excited than me if Bigfoot was actually proved to be true. The one person to be more excited than me is Craig Stanford, who is a primatologist and teaches at USC, and he has like a whole room full of, he's obsessed with Bigfoot. And he's got a whole room full of Bigfoot memorabilia and all this stuff. He's just totally into Bigfoot. But so far, Bigfoot has yet to be, yet to be proven. In fact, many, many of the, the you know, photographic and other evidence for Bigfoot has, has, been, has turned out to be a hoax, unfortunately. But maybe someday Bigfoot will be, will be real. OK, here's another unreal monkey, perhaps you remember from The Wizard of Oz. Let's talk about some monkey adaptations. Ah, no, let's stop here. That's perfect, because this is a good place to pick up in the next class.